basically allergic rhinitis is a triad of sneezing nasal discharge and nasal block in response to an allergen that allergen we call an antigen which may be either an inhalant like dust pollen it can be an ingestant like maybe milk products egg fish prawns etc it could be even some medication like aspirin if the patient is on aspirin or some of the anti hypertensives or even it could be intestinal helminths like worm ingestions so the antigen could be anything and in response to this when the patient has these symptoms we call it an allergic rhinitis this is a ig mediated inflammation of the upper respiratory tract which later on progresses to the lower respiratory tract basically allergy is seen all over the world as you know and the incidence of allergy is increasing 25% of the world's population suffers from allergy and when we consider allergy as a single unit 55% of allergies constitute allergic rhinitis so allergic rhinitis forms the largest group of patients suffering from allergy as far as the incidence is concerned it's maximum seen between 10 to 30 years of age so the second third decade of life is showing the peak and male and female there is an equal predisposition there is no difference as far as them usually the patients come with recurrent colds it doesn't keep them in bed the patients go to office but obviously do not work in the office they come with sneezing nasal discharge nasal block this irritation itching in the eyes itching in the throat and if left untreated these then go on to neighboring structures like the sinuses the middle ear the lower respiratory tract and patients land up with asthma also so there are a lot of other situations where the patients may present to us with rather than just a nasal discharge or a nasal block the main problem is the nasal block but the nasal block itself you know makes them tired they cannot concentrate on their work it makes them drowsy they don't sleep well so the basic lifestyle of a person of a patient gets affected their quality of life is not only affected even their enthusiasm in work goes down clinically they would come to us with sinusitis the nasal uh, polyps may occur with which again i mean such a distressing symptom that the patient has to breathe from his mouth the patients may come with ear blockage decrease hearing or even ear discharge if leads to a perforation and post nasal drip chronic cough they keep on coughing whole day and night or they may come with wheezing or ronchi and asthma basically full blown asthma there is definitely a diurnal variation these patients worsen in the morning when they just get up from sleep the discharge the sneezing increases considerably the reason is probably when they put their foot on a floor which is cold and they are in a warm bed it's a change of temperature so vasomotor rhinitis gets added on to it or they may go into the bathroom and the basin they just wash their face suddenly cold water onto the face and the seizing episode starts so patients worsen early morning and over the period the symptoms reduce the clinical history is there is a definite uh, familial incidence in this if both parents are suffering from allergy you know, there's a history that even my parents had that or you know grandparents had asthma so there is a definite uh, genetic predisposition as far as allergy is concerned secondly 
whenever there is one is stressed stress would also trigger off allergy so they are you know working very hard stressed out and this allergy factor increases they come up with initial symptoms of recurrent sneezing nasal discharge and block as we earlier discussed but this now does not clear up it gets into an infected sinusitis now they have fever they have headache and now that does not allow them to go to the office so we lose man days in fact in the uk sinusitis is the first cause of loss of man days as even compared to hypertension and arthritis so here in for unfortunately in our country people go to the office we don't lose man days but they don't work in the office so they basically i mean it not only affects their lifestyle it affects their work and they go into comorbid situations where they come over to a specialist the clinical history is very apparent i mean it's just a family history then you ask them about stress and other thing is i mean the diagnosis there on the face of the patient really speaking i mean there is not much that is uh, to be extracted as far as history is concerned because every patient of allergic rhinitis will be troubled by dust will be troubled by stress will be troubled by perfumes as far as the triggering factors are concerned it, one is that there is sudden change of climate either from hot to cold or cold to hot secondly it could be as i said stress a sudden increase of workload or stress or it could be a hormonal change you know as far as female patients are concerned or if the patient is suddenly in an atmosphere where somebody is smoking as a passive smoker this would trigger off or if uh, they have used a certain deodorant or a perfume and they get the episode so these are all triggering factors where the patient's allergy gets exacerbated to understand the comorbid conditions it is important to know a little about the anatomy and since probably you may not be so aware of the anatomy of the nose you have to think of a structure which is the eustachian tube a hollow tubular organ which connects the nose with the ear and the nasopharynx so what happens we are talking about allergy in the nose now this allergy causes the mucosa in the eustachian tube to block the middle ear the ear gets blocked and the same discharge comes into the throat leading to low respiratory tract infections now when we see the lungs the same respiratory tract is a continuation of the lower respiratory tract from the tip of the nose till the terminal bronchi of the lung you have the same epithelium pseudo stratified columnar respiratory epithelium the same epithelium gets into the middle ear so whenever the patients are suffering from allergic rhinitis which is not adequately controlled it leads to infections in the middle ear it causes pharyngitis and it leads to asthma as far as asthma is concerned 80% of the asthmatics suffer from allergic rhinitis so the moment you treat the allergic rhinitis the intensity and frequency of asthma goes down you treat the allergic rhinitis post nasal drip cough pharyngitis tonsillitis goes down with that also includes the adenoids over here the moment we treat allergic rhinitis in the ear we have serious otitis media and suppurative otitis media that comes under control so these all include the comorbid situations arising because of allergic rhinitis basically it affects their daily working because first thing is that they don't sleep well at night 
Secondly, because of mouth breathing, they get tired soon, there is headache, brings annoyance in them, the concentration goes down in their work. In children, we especially see that uh, they are drowsy in school, so it affects their scholastic or academic growth or development and their work would definitely, definitely go down because basic oxygenation is less. The diagnosis of allergic rhinitis is basically a clinical diagnosis. We do not advise, at least in our practice in ENT, I don't think anybody advises the skin allergy tests or RAST or the Ig levels which obviously would be high. So the diagnosis is written on the face of the patient. The patient comes and sits in front, we know that this patient has allergy because there is a certain shine on the face, it's like an allergic shine. Secondly, in children especially, you find they give you a salute, what is called as an allergic salute. The child will be rubbing the nose and that is an allergic salute. Constantly by trying to clean the nose, there is a horizontal line or bridge on the bridge of the nose which is called as the Darrier's line. And these patients who suffer from allergy make various grimaces on their face. You know, they try to clear up their nose or they try to you know, open up their nose by certain expressions. So these grimaces which are seen on the face itself tell us, tells us that the patient has allergy. This is on just seeing the patient's face. Now when we examine the nose from inside, the mucosa is edematous, the turbinates are hypertrophied. On seeing the throat, there may be presence of polyps if it's a long-standing allergy. On examination of the throat, there may be post-nasal drip, there would be pharyngitis and the diagnosis is established with this. The discharge from the nose is always watery, copious bilateral watery discharge and the diagnosis is made by this. Uh, we really speaking don't do any diagnostic tests. The diagnosis is in front of us. It's basically more of a theoretical or an academic exercise to do a diagnostic test. Uh, first, most important in allergy is environmental factors, that is avoidance. Avoidance of the allergen. The moment if you can identify and avoid a certain allergen, it is wonderful, the whole problem is solved. But most of the time we do not know what it is and it's not possible to avoid because not only house dust mites, the safest place where the patient comes in, being in the bedroom, totally closed, sitting, lying in the bed is one of the most dangerous places. So therefore it's very difficult to come away from allergy that because even in the bedroom one will find dust mites, there will be an air conditioner which is the best breeding point for an allergen like fungus because it has a filter where the air is moistened, wet, humid air, very good for fungus to grow. So there is no safe place and it's obviously very difficult to eliminate or avoid all factors. But ideally I would prefer to avoid and avoidance would be the first line of treatment. If with avoidance the patient does not get benefit, next would be to use a non-sedative antihistamine. With a non-sedative antihistamine, if the patient is not fully relieved, I would add a intranasal corticosteroid, a nasal spray that is topical corticosteroids. If with that also the patient does not improve, next we go on to add an oral steroid. And finally, if there is no response to the combination patient would require surgical approach. Basically, uh, we call it acute. I mean, when the patient comes with acute rhinitis, it's usually up to three weeks that is supposed to be acute rhinitis. Then it goes into the next stage from maybe three weeks to three months. And beyond three months, if this persists, it goes into chronic, chronic rhinitis or chronic sinusitis. About antihistamines, I mean there are various groups of antihistamines you must have heard of. We have first generation, second generation, third generation antihistamines. 
now you must have just heard of third generation antihistamines but good number of our seniors still use the first generation antihistamines it's like you still find you will find fiat on the road with maruti is also running and uh, you have honda and skoda also on the road so basically these first generation antihistamines like i mean chlorpheniramine where uh, evil is quite synonymous with they are highly potent but the problem is that the multiple dosing is required you require to give it thrice a day to the patients since it crosses the blood brain barrier it causes sedation and lot of these anticholinergic effects like drying are quite distressing to the patient and therefore we go into the second generation of antihistamines where the duration of action becomes longer but certain limitations as far as using them with other drugs especially like uh, with tofenadine etc where you cannot use it with ketoconazoles or macrolides and cardiac problems like prolonging of qt interval restrict the use of the second generation and what we now use is the third generation antihistamines where once a day usage is done they are non sedative because we always talked of quality of life how the patient would be at work how the patient would perform and these third generation antihistamines are preferred for that reason usually given for a period of 3 weeks when the patient comes to us we write it for 3 weeks and tell the patient whenever you require it you can take it because there is a very wide safety margin i mean as far as the dosing is concerned and since there is no drug interaction patient can take these medications as well also in allergy whenever there is an allergen that strikes there is a immediate and a late phase response and the late phase response is countered by the anti inflammatory effect so the long term effects as far as allergy should be under control would be important as far as this anti inflammatory action is concerned especially if rhinitis sinusitis is persisting for over 3 months secondly if it actually forms a polyp or then we get a ct scan done and we see if the osteomeatal complex is blocked or not i like to just show it to you over here now if this is the nose we have the maxillary sinuses we have the orbit we have the ethmoid sinuses now the nose is lined by the respiratory epithelium the same respiratory epithelium gets into the sinuses also the respiratory epithelium is lined by cilia the cilia beat at a constant fashion and every 20 minutes the sinuses get cleared of the mucus so all the mucus from the sinuses gets cleared from the osteomeatal complex every 20 minutes we don't have to blow our nose every 20 minutes so if this osteomeatal complex is blocked by a polyp or by even a deviated septum or by any other fungus ball or whatever then we the patient goes into chronic sinusitis because there will be accumulation of fluid inside leading to secondary infection and chronic sinusitis so there whatever antibiotic decongestant anything added along with an antihistamine will not help and what we require is we go endoscopically open the natural ostia and allow the natural drainage so this mucociliary clearance of the sinuses is to be established and that is the key or the essence to nasal sinus endoscopy where a surgical intervention would be required after surgical management we keep the patient for 3 weeks on an antihistamine and a nasal spray so that the lining which comes is healthier it is without any you know inflammation and the sinus ostia remains patent so 3 weeks post operative we use an antihistamine always
we do step up in an acute attack of a full blown allergy. What happens that the histamine levels are very high and when we give a dose which is even double the normal therapeutic level, the allergy inflammation, allergic inflammation in the mucosa becomes less and we get a better response for the patient. However, I would feel that after 7 to 8 days when this comes back to normal, see the histamine levels, we can get back to the normal regular therapeutic dose. And since drugs like fexofenidine, which have a very safe therapeutic margin and a window, could be, we could comfortably double the dose for a short period in an acute allergic attack.